morning and welcome to our very first Psych Sessions New Year's Extravaganza Podference. I am Dr. Eric Landrum, one of the co-founders of Psych Sessions, and I am thrilled that you've been able to join us this morning. Uh, we have five speakers lined up to talk to you today, and they'll be available uh, to you uh at your convenience. That's the uh, beauty of this podference. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker this morning, I just want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, this is a lovely idea, and I want to give credit to Garth Neufeld, my uh, co-conspirator in crime, for having this lovely notion of not only thinking ahead and recording um, conference speakers around the country, but then bundling them in a way to provide this lovely notion of professional development to colleagues around the nation. So, for example, uh, our first speaker this morning, Barney Bynes from Ithaca College, uh, I was unable to go to the 2018 New England Psychological Association Conference and hear Barney's talk. And so, this is a great way for people around the country uh, who don't get to travel to all of these great conferences and hear these amazing speakers. Uh, it's a great way for us to have professional development. And because of the podcast format and because it's free through Psych Sessions, I, I, I think it's just an amazing professional development opportunity for all of us. And even if you were there, it's lovely to have it as an archival record to go back and listen to again. And so, Garth, I want to thank you for having the foresight and the forethought to be able to not only record these and make the effort to do that, uh, but also then to bundle these together. And so we hope to do this uh, every New Year's Day. And if we record enough of these over the course of a year, we'll try to have a, a bonus podference during a year um, to release. And so thank you for joining us. And so uh, this morning, our first speaker is Barney Bynes from Ithaca College. Um, he presented the Ted Bosak Lecture Series Keynote Address at the 2018 New England Psychological Association Conference. Now, just a little bit about uh, Dr. Bynes. Uh, in 1979, he received his Ph.D. from the City University of New York in New York City. Uh, if you know Barney, he's an extremely accomplished academic amongst the teaching of psychology community. Uh, just a couple of highlights, because again, as you've heard so many introductions over the years, if I if I actually spent the time to uh, truly give Barney an introduction that he is due, with all joking aside, it would double the length of this podcast uh, episode. Uh, in 2010, he received the Charles L. Brewer Distinguished Teaching Award uh, from the American Psychological Foundation. Um, he has uh, received... Um, Fellow status from divisions uh, one, two, three, and fifty-two. Um, the only slight disappointment in that Barney, and I doubt if he'll ever listen to this introduction, is that he did not receive those in numerical order. He actually received uh, fellow status from division two first in his career. Um, he has served as president of, of Division Two. He has served as uh, a member of the Board of Educational Affairs. He has served as president of the Eastern Psychological Association and the president of the New England Psychological Association. Um, I'm sorry, he's currently, I apologize, he's currently the president-elect in 2020 of the Eastern Psychological Association. He has served as a member of the Council of Representatives for the American Psychological Association. He is a fellow, I believe, of the American, I'm sorry, the Association for Psychological Science. And so I could go on and on. But again, um, you have uh, tuned in to listen to him and not to me. And so um, this address was originally delivered um, November 9th, 2018 in Worcester, Mass. And the title, Psychology from Beginning to End, What Do We Want Our Students to Learn? Ladies and gentlemen, Barney Bynes. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, I'm delighted to be the inaugural TED Talk. At <laughs> and if there is anybody who uh, I, I respect in, on many, many dimensions, it's TED. We've been friends for quite a long time, 
and I consider it an honor to be a, a friend of Ted's and have the opportunity to, to give the first Ted Bozak lecture. And it's sort of interesting, independently of what other speakers uh, have said, I came up with a topic that it echoes so much of what has been talked about today. And in fact, I, I had an original idea once, but it got lonely and went away. So th this talk is simply a reiteration of everything I've heard today. It has nothing to do with me. Well, to start off with, uh, let me just say this is sort of a, 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 an essay that I'm, I'm giving right now. An essay in the traditional sense of meaning to try something out, to evaluate, to analyze. Because I think I believe what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I know there are limitations and I know there are holes and I would welcome comments from you along the way to help me formulate the thoughts that I've started developing. And if we run out of time, that's okay because I kept the boring stuff at the end when I figured you'd be asleep anyway. So if I don't make it all the way through, that's okay if, if part of the reason is that we're engaging in good discussions. <clears throat> and I would just like to, again, pay tribute to Ted. And this is Ted and his wife, Jean, who is also a dear friend. Uh, and uh, again, they're the finest people. What do we want our students to learn? So take a moment and think of some of the critical things you want your students to learn in introductory psychology. And I'm, I'm putting an intro because we've been talking about that a lot today, but I think what, uh, what we'll be talking about is true throughout the curriculum. So think of a couple things that you think a student in introductory psychology should leave your course with having learned. Why? What is that set of things, those ideas that you think students should leave with? That's a question that I think we haven't begun to address, or we've, we've begun to address it, but for the longest time, we didn't. And the question is, are we making good decisions about what it is we teach our students? Why is this important? Well, if you take a look at the number of U.S. bachelor's degrees in psychology, and thanks to Eric Landrum for this, it's broken down by gender, and it's not no surprise that we have a significant woman problem in psychology. <laughs> We're educating a lot of people. So it would be nice if when they leave, there is something positive about that they take with them, that we have helped provide. And Wall Street Journal psych majors aren't happy with their options. They leave us and they're not happy, 26% or something like that. So, you can read that. I'm not going to engage in PowerPoint karaoke, so you can <laughs> do that. So, there are there issues that we have to deal with, and, and I think the answer clearly is yes. And it's not that we're not dealing with it. It's just that psychology is a difficult discipline to get a handle on. And part of it is, and again, thanks to Eric Landrum on this, unlike areas like nursing or uh, teacher education, which have a specific goal in mind, we don't have that goal. Our student, we're educating our students in the liberal arts, where it's often not clear what's going to happen when they leave, which ma makes it difficult. The, the biologist, uh, uh, J.B.S. Haldane, once commented that he supposed nature is not only queerer than we suppose, it's queerer than we can suppose. And I think in terms of teaching psychology, teaching psychology is not only more difficult than we suppose, it's more difficult than we can suppose. And if you were at some of the, the talks today, the issues that we have to face 
are, are enormous. And the idea of what do we teach in introductory psychology, the list was so long, good luck in 14 weeks. And that, that's, that's a per perpetual issue. So what I would like you to do now is look on the, uh, uh, the table where you're sitting and there's a, uh, quotation, a set of quotations there. And just read through it quickly. Does that sound familiar? Those words appeared in a chapter I wrote for a 1992 <laughs> book called Teaching Psychology in America, A History. Except I didn't write them. Those are nearly verbatim quotations from journal articles that appeared as far back as 1910. So it's nothing new. And we haven't solved them in over a century. I think we're, we have begun to make progress. So when we teach our students, when our students learn, we need to consider what we teach them. What are the facts? And where do, where do the, the challenges arise? So, in the good old days, like 1876, students come to the professor miserably prepared regarding his instruction as so much of an impediment between them and their degrees. Many students have almost literally to be taught to re read intelligently. And students whose palms begin to sweat at the thought of numbers. So, what, what challenges we face? Are we to blame? We, us in this room, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. And an excerpt from the 1947 article about a faculty member in a large Midwestern university who lectured to a class for three weeks before discovering he was not using his lecture note, he was using his lecture notes for another course not scheduled for that semester. Okay, so I don't think that's happened quite to, to all that many people in this room, but, but we need to take some of the responsibility. So that maybe psychology doesn't matter. So when our students leave, what they have left with isn't particularly helpful. And, and from 1924, in the early days, this science was kept strictly confined to the colleges, had no particular connection with anything at all, and did no visible harm to those who studied it. All this has changed. There's not only a psychology in the academic or college sense, but a psychology of business, education, salesmanship, a psychology of religion, and a, religion, and a psychology of playing the banjo. Okay. So are we, are, are we in the position of teaching things that ultimately are not going to make a difference? And, and the answer clearly is no. But we do need to think about what it is we do teach. Now here is a 1938 journal article about applied psychology. It teaches us to observe and the fundamentals of intelligent salesmanship. You can make good sections once you understand the psychology behind suggesting the merchandise the right way. So a weak statement, this is nice rouge. A good statement, this rouge will blend well with your complexion. So this is the, the applied psychology. I think we're doing a little better than that. But for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And we, we have faced that. So what do we actually teach in introductory psychology? In 1993, Qureshi studied 52 intro psych books. And Mostly, the t uh, any given term, and I think he, this was one where he looked in glossaries, there was remarkably little overlap. Only 23, or 23% of the terms used in only one book, uh, and 23% in more than 15. Which means that there are, were lots of books, there are lots of books that have non-overlapping information in introductory psychology. Uh, Eric Landrum, Eric is hard to get away from. He did a page by page an examination of six books. Only 90% of the, over 90% were unique to a single book. 
Zechmeister and Zechmeister, 49% of the terms in only one book, they said in 10, only 3% were common to all of them. So what happened to the core of psychology that we're supposed to be teaching? Where did it go? Uh, Rich Griggs examined three books from the 1950s and found that 75% of the terms appeared in only one book. So back in the 1950s, there was no consensus about what students should learn in introductory psychology. Uh, he concluded that if there, was, there, if there was no real core in the 50s, there probably never has been. What do we teach? So we, we do need to teach facts. So the facial feedback hypothesis. So we, we teach this, and it's pretty cool, where if you put your pen like this, you smile and you're in a better mood. If you're like this, it's more of a pout, and your mood is not so good. Except whenever I try it, I wind up drooling. <laughs> so what, what do you know about the research on the facial feedback hypothesis? It can't be replicated. Can't be replicated. Wonderful fact, wonderful theory, dashed on the rocks of reality. So we're teaching the facts of, of, of psychology. Do the facts change? Facial feedback hypothesis doesn't replicate. But Leo, that's where you're wrong. We have more facts. When do we start teaching all of these facts? The facial feedback hypothesis does replicate. So what do we teach? Is it a fact or isn't it? In fact, what is a fact? That's not rhetorical, Michael. It's something that's made up. Uh, sort of. Buddha, the root of uh, the word is to make, factor. Mm hmm. Yeah, for those of you who are facile with Latin. That's right. <laughs> not me. <laughs> uh, but there's a little bit more to it than something made up. Clear, clearly, facts are made up. It doesn't mean they're fiction, but they are made up, they're constructed. Facts are things that we agree are true. They don't have to be true, but we agree they're true. So we, we agreed that the facial feedback hypothesis was true, and then we agreed that it wasn't true. Now we agree that sometimes it is, and, and the difference appears to be if you replicate it with participants who know that they're being uh, videotaped, it doesn't replicate. But if you use the original procedure that did not involve videotaping them, it does replicate. So what should, what should we be teaching? Type A personality. How many of you teach about type A personality? Don't raise your hand so quickly you might wind up being embarrassed. Just the other day, <laughs> Uh, I read that there was a report, there is no such thing as a type A personality. It, it's a multi-construct thing. But it's, it's a nice fact, or sort of anyway. So what do we teach? And the question is, are the facts that we're teaching worth teaching? So you see these, these illustrations here where we have, we have brightness contrast, and then we have the Gestalt laws of organization, and then we have the, the vase face, the Rubin face, which looks actually to me like Alfred Hitchcock looking into a mirror. <laughs> they appear in your, your, your textbooks, right? These are really old. These il illustrations come from uh, Boring and Langfeld's 1949 book and Cole's 1937 intro book. Haven't we gone a little bit further than that in our research? Do students really need to know that stuff? Maybe they do. 
but this is really old. What, Rubin's face was from 1915? You know, the, the Alfred Hitchcock thing? So again, are the facts worth teaching? And if you were in the, the session, the lunch session this afternoon, I used this quotation that defines psychology with a touch of cynicism as what the science of what everybody knew beforehand anyway. So I use the examples that are up here. I'm not going to go through them again. And if you didn't, if you weren't here for the lunch, see me, and, and I have the, the materials on my website, and you can access them there. But the thing is, the obvious is not so obvious. And the wonderful Yogi Berra quotes, tough to make prediction, predictions, especially about the future. Well, our facts are obvious in retrospect, but not going in. Maybe facts are worth teaching. But what I think is more important, and Missy, you hit on this, and, and I was really mad because I thought I was going to have breaking news and you scooped me on this is that it's the concepts that are important, I think. So, for example, two concepts that go together, I think, proof and replication. Students think science proves things. It doesn't, as, as you all know. It in, we can increase our confidence and our belief, but we don't prove things. And one of the reasons we need to replicate is because we don't prove things. We need to replicate to find out, should we have confidence? So here we have fact, we have data. How many of you have seen this before? Okay. So there is a uh, significant correlation between per, cheese, per capita cheese uh, consumption and the number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bed sheets. So that's a fact but it probably merits replication. If you, uh, if you Google spurious correlations, you'll, you'll, you'll get to a website that has this and a whole bunch of data sets where you can combine all kinds of things. And um, correlations appear magically that are absolutely meaningless. And there is a correlation between the age of Miss America and the number of murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. And Miss America is now, this year, 25 years old. It's the oldest. So be careful. <laughs> so what doesn't replicate? Well, unfortunately, surprising findings tend not to replicate. Like this thing, good-looking couples have more daughters. There's actually a, a theoretical basis for speculating this might occur. And there was some research that showed it, but then it didn't replicate. What else doesn't replicate? It looks like priming is, is sort of shaky. The Lady Macbeth effect, slower walking with primes about aging, and the power pose. And interestingly, all of the people who do, did the original research are, are mad as wet hens when people call the research into question. And in fact, I think it was Barg, the, the slow walking guy, who really had a vitriolic reaction when, when his research was not uh, replicated and people pointed out, making ad hominem attacks against the other researchers. Okay, does the power pose work? Well, Amy Cuddy thinks so, but lots of other people don't. Nonetheless, Google it, and it, like you'll, you'll wind up with this page here, which gives you advice on how to be more powerful. Do this two minutes a day, and you will be more powerful. And do you know who invented Wonder Woman? Missy, who invented Wonder Woman? Do you remember the name off the top of your head? There's been a movie about him. Um, I can't remember his name. William Marston? Yes, and the Golden Lasso. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because he was also supposed to fly the next version. Yeah, he was a psychologist. Yeah. What else doesn't replicate? You know, we talk about the replication crisis in psychology. 
my one word response to that, close your ears if they're delicate, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, 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 the hundred studies, only 39 of them replicated. Well, replicated, non-replicated studies might have been flawed, but another 25 of them were in the same direction, just not statistically significant. So two-thirds of the studies were actually pointing in the same direction. And it turns out that we are not the only science with the replication issue. Biology recently started a thing like Brian Nozek did. Um, cancer research. Of 53 uh, um, classic cancer studies, six of them replicated. And these are the classic cancer studies. Bayer, the people who make Bayer aspirin, did an in-house thing of replicating some of their research, 25% replicated. So when you're on the cutting edge, when you're on the boundary of what we know and what we don't know, you're going to make mistakes, especially when you're dealing with complex systems. I tell my students, you, did I tell you guys this? These are my two students who have a, who are presenting at a poster, um, and they are really smart. Okay. Is that right? <laughs> um, and and, and uh, what was I talking about? I, got, I get off track. We were talking about the, the cancer research, and oh, and Bayer, 25%. Yeah. Um, when you're on the edge of what we know and what you don't know, you're going to make mistakes. And I, I tell my students, if you want a simple discipline, major in chemistry. The tools are complicated, but the concepts are simple. So if you, if you want simple concepts, major in chemistry. And if we measure the difficulty of a discipline based on the tools, my auto mechanic is a whole lot smarter than I am. Because the tools he uses are much more complicated than I could ever use. But what doesn't replicate, getting back here, cancer research. Astronomy. So my question is, how can you lose a whole planet? So they, they, they discovered uh, a planet out there that is earth size, you know, an exoplanet, maybe with water, maybe with life, pretty cool stuff. Oops. Well, we're not sure it's actually there. And why is that? Because it's complicated. They, stars are, are bright, planets are not bright, and they measure it by little infinitesimal wobbles in the, planet, in the sun's orbit, or a slight dimming of the, the uh, uh, illumination provided by the star as a, a planet transits in front of it. But they're far, far away. They're going to make mistakes. And this, it's not because it's bad science, there's nothing wrong, it's just they're on the edge of knowledge. So, proof, replication, those are the things we should be talking to our students about. That we don't prove, but we do replicate. Another thing, and of course, every student just loves talking about measurement validity. <laughs> and, and rightfully so, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, psychologist class, how easy it is to implant false memories and committing a crime. You know, the kind of Beth Loftus sort of thing. They did some research, 70% of participants had, they were able to implant me false memories in. About being at a party, you uh, got into a fight, they had to call the cops. Cops came and, and, you know, we got this information from your parents. And of course, as you would expect from psychologists, they were lying through their teeth. So, what do you remember about this? And so people would make up, they, they would give details, and they said that if anybody could remember 10 details about this supposed uh, altercation and, and uh, uh, intervention by the police, then it meant a, a, a false memory was implanted. But the way they measured it, they said, well, I, it was at my house, and my friend Jordan was there, uh, and Jordan was wearing a red shirt, and details like this. So that's already three details. And 
if you had a party at some point at your house, if you had a friend named Jordan, if Jordan tended to wear red shirts, you know, already you're three-tenths of the way toward an implanted memory, which doesn't really make any sense. Because they would remember things where that, that involved sort of like, well, if it did happen, this is probably what it was like. So some researchers went back and replicated and found about a 35% implanting memory, which is what all the other researchers have found. So you need to, to make sure that they measure things correctly. They were the, the, the striking memory, which doesn't replicate, because striking findings tend not to replicate. Their measurements weren't particularly good. They weren't real pleased when other researchers said you're wrong, but that's nothing new. Take home message, measurement is important. So more on validity of measurements. So do you follow the, the US government's guidelines for nutrition and what you eat? Five to nine vegetables and fruits per day and we're allowed to have milk fat now, it's good for us. Last year it wasn't. Okay. So, good to hear, I know, yeah. So, uh, should you find the government's dietary guidelines? Well, how many of you are familiar with uh, Nate Silver's web uh, thing 538? Okay, well, this, oh, and, and this, is, this is wonderful here too. Uh, if you look at the nutrition research, you know, some of the correlations that appear. Okay, there is a correlation between eating raw tomatoes and being Jewish, between eating egg rolls and owning a dog, and you know, P is point zero 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 one. so this is really true. Okay. Uh, sh shellfish and right-handedness. I mean, this is the stuff we should be telling, teaching the students. This is the cool stuff. Well, according to the 538 people, they, they think that nutrition research is useless. And here is a clip. I think our lovely friends at State Farm will be inserting an ad before we actually see it. So is, is measurement at all important to what we do? <laughs> So if you're going out to dinner and ordering ribs, you'll know that, please, I would like two cups of ribs. And I'm sure they'll be happy to accommodate. Why is, why is this so hard? Because nothing is simple. Keep talking. Keep talking, okay. So people seldom tell me to keep talking. <laughs> and one of the, one of the, Issues that is, is very important that I think we do not focus on enough is error in measurement. And it's not error because of sloppiness, it's because systems we're dealing with are complicated. And the National Weather Service has caught on to this fact when they create the cone of uncertainty in dealing with where is the hurricane going to go. And people are willing to live with the cone of uncertainty because they know that it's complicated. But for the longest time, the, the Weather Service did not want to acknowledge the fact that there was measurement error when they measured. And in North Dakota, this 20 years ago, there was, uh, they had massive rains and big floods potential. And so they said the flood is, in this particular river is, uh, or they, the river is gonna rise to 47 feet. And the people said, Phew, that's great, because flood stage is at 53 feet. The one little bit of information that the Weather Service didn't provide was that the standard error of measurement was 12 feet. <laughs> massive flood, massive damages, because they didn't take precautions. And that's because the Weather Service didn't give them a, a measure an error measurement, because they thought people wouldn't take them seriously if they said, here's our guess, but it could be this high or this low. 
But in reality, with floods, as with human behavior, there's always measurement error. That, I think we need to focus on that with our students. What are we measuring and is, is it getting at what we want? Or is it cheese and dying in your bed sheets? <clears throat> so another, credibility of sources. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about politics. <laughs> So we have various different sources here. Uh, The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws pointed out that marijuana regulation uh, and crime rates, uh, that that when increase in use of marijuana is not associated with increase in crime rate. Do you believe them? Used to be before we had digital clocks, that even a broken clock was right twice a day. But the National Organization for the uh, Reform of Marijuana Laws sort of have an agenda. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but you need to consider how credible they are. Uh, The American Beverage Association slams a study linking soda consumption to negative childhood behavior. And in in all of the news articles I read, the news article said, the researchers said we can't attribute causation because it's a correlational study. But that's not what was implied in the headlines, which is what people tend to read more than the actual news in the news story. And it turns out that the the measurements they used were not particularly, well, they were like the, the food study measurements. They would ask parents how much soda does your child drink? Do you know how much your kids drink? I don't. I don't know how much your kids drink. I didn't know how much my (laughs) kids drink. So I sort of believe the American Beverage Association, even though they have a vested interest in saying that study is no good. So they might be right. And then from natural news, the researchers discover, discover the link between sugar consumption and mental illness. Well, if you look at their uh, statement about this is our mission, basically it can translate the statement this is our mission to we hate sugar. <laughs> Are they credible? And then, in terms, and and this goes beyond psychology. So, climate change. So, here we have this was on Australian and Australian television where there was a drought. Is it caused by human elements of uh, uh, human elements affecting climate change? They had the guy in the top who was a naysayer from Auckland. Being from Auckland is not problematic in and of itself. But he was the guy who said, no, it's not climate change caused by humans. The guy on the bottom, in the right, was a member of Tony Blair's administration when Tony Blair was prime minister in England. Can you spot the scientists in this image? Why are we listening to these people? We need to tell our students you have to assess the credibility of the sources. And in fact, the guy in the hat, and again, being from Auckland in, in itself is not a problem, but he wrote the book called Palmistry, which is a book about how to detect your cat's personality based on its paw print. So in my head, there's, there's a slight credibility issue here. These kind of concepts are important. You know, there are facts out there, and we have to resign ourselves to the, the idea that we're going to be wrong sometimes. But it's not the facts when we teach that we should concentrate on. We should concentrate on the important elements of how we think about things. And theory versus hypothesis, and data versus opinion. A theory is as far as you can go in science. 
a theory is an explanatory framework that, that it captures the data more effectively than any other explanation. You can't get better than a theory. So evolution, oh, it's only a theory. Well, yes. Thank God it's a theory. It's the best single explanation for the natural world around us. And sometimes people do, more than sometimes, people confuse theory and hypothesis. Well, it's only a hypothesis, or it's only a theory, and they mean hypothesis, and that's something we test. And then data versus opinion, just because I really want it to be true doesn't make it true. And in fact, there are dimwits in Washington. Is that an offensive term, dimwit? Okay. There are dimwits in Washington. Okay. And this was from last summer. There was a Republican congressman. There's nothing wrong with being Republican in and of itself. It's like being from Auckland. Okay. But a Republican congressman asks if rocks are causing sea levels to rise because too many rocks are falling in the water. I think he might be short on data. <laughs> but the onion, of course, being what it is, <laughs> ocean levels could rise a foot or more if lots of people go swimming. <laughs> we have to do everything we can with our students to get them to recognize the principles of science. And that, ca that came out during the... the talk this afternoon is that what do you want in your introductory psychology? People to know about science, that psychology is a science, how to evaluate scientific evidence. That's the only way we're going to solve this problem. And it's not an easy problem to solve because it's psychology. It's complicated human thought and behavior. Okay. Another, you might, you might pick up that I have occasional pet peeves. Okay. Learn versus innate, nature versus nurture, and the most sagacious statement on that is it's 100% nature and it's 100% nurture. It's a stupid question. <laughs> Along with, there's a gene for that. And, you know, and people believe this stuff. Is violence in the genes? Some research, credible research. It's not a, you know, not, a, not a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing, but it makes its way into the news. One in three men have uh, the violence gene. There is a gene for violence. You know, we can just snip that thing right out, and it, it, it's all you know, kumbaya. <laughs> Uh, and and the, the research on this, first of all, the, the effect size was 0.02 or to 0.03. And low effect sizes in and of themselves are not, they, they can be useful, like, the, like their uh, aspirin and heart attack thing, take low-dose aspirin. The, the effect size there is like 0.04. So small effect sizes aren't problematic. They, they could be useful when you look at populations just... Oh, wait a minute. The research on those low-dose aspirin regimens doesn't actually replicate for many people. Another, another nice fact that we can base our life on that isn't a real fact anymore. Getting back to this gene for violence, one in three men have it, has a low effect size. And what they did was they looked at the genes and allele, this was an allele of a particular gene, uh, of the alleles in a prison population. And the dependent measure was the risk of being incarcerated, or percent, per probability of being incarcerated. So what do we have? We have lots of minorities in prison. They get prison sentences where non-majority people don't get prison sentences. So if there is a gene with an allele that is associated with ethnic minorities, it is also associated with being incarcerated. This is important for our students to know. 
the con some of the concepts are very complicated, but they're important, con they're important concepts for them to know. And in some research, uh, th this is laboratory research, and the idea is, in this scenario, how many, how many participants recommended the death sentence, and they looked at it in terms of low danger in the future by this person or high danger by this person. <clears throat> and if you take a look at where, and the, on the x-axis are uh, this control condition uh, statement that problems are environmental, environmentally caused, or genetically caused, or an interaction between genes and the environment. You can see that 35% low danger, but it's a gene, which means they're going to be violent, which a lot of people would accept, but we know that it's more complicated than that. Okay. I think I know the answer to this question. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? College teachers, in spite of the fact that they spend their time in front of groups talking, claim to be introverts. If that was actually true, I'd be standing here silently waiting for you to leave the room. <laughs> and I'm expecting you to leave the room at any minute, but I'm not standing here silently waiting for you to. That's a stupid question. I'm just getting food. <laughs> okay. So why, why is this a stupid question? And that's not a rhetorical question. Somewhere in the middle. It's not dichotomous. My students are smart. <laughs> We do this all the time. Are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? And of course, the dichotomy on steroids is the Myers-Briggs, of course. It's, we're, we're not one or the other, although we, we fall into that trap. Are you left-handed or are you right-handed? Not a good question. Is there anybody who doesn't use their left hand for anything? But Dichotomies are easy. Gender, male and female. Oops. Dichotomies be damned. <laughs> I, I tell my students that dichotomies are not our friend because there's nothing of any interest in psychology that is dichotomous. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould, who probably a number of you read his essays and his work, he's dead now but you read his work when he was alive. He's not publishing much yet. He said there's only one actual dichotomy of any value in the world, and that is whether you are for or against the designated hitter. <laughs> Other than that, dichotomies are not useful ways to think about things. But according to the research, we do it. For complicated information... It's an effective way to reduce the cognitive load, and we do it. And it's based on, remember the old serial position effect? The first information we encounter. That sort of sets the anchor for the way we dichotomize the information we encounter when it's complicated. <clears throat> and I had a conversation with Leo a couple of years ago about pit bulls. In... Uh, was it Toronto or Montreal? All those Canadian cities lay out there. Montreal. Okay, yeah. They, they outlawed pit bulls. So, what constitutes a pit bull? Or a closely related species? Well, how much pit bullness do you have to have for the thing to be a pit bull? And besides, the, uh, in Britain, you know what they call pit bulls? nanny dogs because they're so good with children. So we have a dichotomy here based on information that really isn't very good. Oops. 
What does this have to do with psychology? We create categories that don't exist. And I think our students really need to know that. And in, in fact, one of the other things, maybe the single most important fact or in concept in psychology, and, and uh, it was either Jordan, either you or Garth mentioned it in your talk about outgroup homogeneity bias. Must have Garth. Garth. That, I think, is the most, single most important concept that our students should learn about in psychology. We are different. The outgroup, they're all alike. You know, so we're creating a, a dichotomy, us versus them, with different characteristics within each group. And, and that's just my own bias, but it's part of this, this using dichotomies. So what I think we need to build into our teaching is the how of thinking. Students need to be self-aware of what they know and how they know it. What constitutes adequate evidence? What constitutes meaningful information? And these, these are not easy questions, but I think they're important questions. What would it take to change their mind? Acceptance of the inevitability of error. Recognition that you need to make decisions with incomplete and in, imperfect information. And they should have an abundance of skepticism, but a paucity of cynicism. You know, that's a fine line there between not accepting something at face value and not accepting it at all. So getting back to the start, does psychology really matter? Psychology major is not happy with their options, with their choice of psychology as a major. This is why psychological thinking matters, because it gives us tools for understanding our world. Not only behavior, but other things like climate change and what, why we need evidence, not just opinion, in decisions that we make. Psychology gives us knowledge and understanding to apply the tools of thinking. And what should we be teaching our students? The facts don't matter. You teach introductory psychology with a textbook that has 20 chapters. It would make no sense whatsoever to cover all of the information. You, you pick and choose. You need, I think you need to pick wisely, but when you pick those facts, you need to embed them in a context of critical and scientific thinking. So our students' education in psychology matters, and we need to do a better job of telling them. Because when they get out there and have a job, what are you using any psychology skills? No, but they are, at least if we've done our job. The specific facts, pretty much irrelevant. Susie Baker, a wonderful friend of mine, taught a, maybe she still teaches, at a course on the psychology of cats and dogs. What does that have to do with anything? It has to do with evidence, thinking, interactions with humans and non-humans. You can teach the students, the students can learn these concepts from learning about the psychology of cats and dogs. So the facts are, I think, pretty much irrelevant. And it, the way we think about the facts is the key. And mostly my approach to teaching is just sort of to bring up topics and facts that I want to talk about. It doesn't matter what class it is. And my, my students have had the benefit of the history of the ampersand, right? 
okay? which is really cool, and it ties in with teaching APA style. <laughs> and we were talking about the Roman convention of naming children and naming months, and that's part of their broader liberal arts education. <laughs> but I just wanted to talk about it anyway. And I think one of the biggest keys to our success with our students is the zeal that we bring into the classroom. And I think that overrides just about anything else, any single factor, lots of important factors. But do we enjoy being with our students? Are we enthusiastic about the chance to interact with them? That, I think, is, is, is what matters. The facts they learn are less important than the context surrounding the facts. And I applaud you for having stayed awake, at least most of you, for most of the talk. Thank you.